Sandra asked me uh, to discuss what materials I recommend for students, and then she went through a whole number of things. I think I'll do that just, it's just, you know, see if it has something to compare notes with, with wherever you're studying, or if you've never heard of some of these things, it might be useful. I don't mean to uh, uh, go into, I've never been the guy who would go into an extended, uh, uh, the perfect medium kind of an approach, the perfect brushes, the perfect anything, but there are, really are better standard, better levels than others. Uh, uh, student grade anything, for example, just isn't gonna get you anywhere. Uh, it, in the world of watercolors, anybody who's played around knows how bad that is. And then uh, the oil paints are the same way. Tons of body and very little color. So, But the, people understand that. Certain brands of, uh, and I don't want to say anything negative about certain brands. So there are some of paper, for example, charcoal paper, that are, uh, that are very much less likely to hold the charcoal over time. It, you know, you can flick them and the charcoal will fall on the floor. A lot of the new archival papers are like that. They, the rag content apparently has gone up. I'm guessing that's what it is. And, the, uh, and so they don't have the porosity to hold the paper because they're trying to, uh, the archival people are trying to avoid having the acids that are the inherent in the more porous, uh, what I guess are, are wood-based papers. Um, but, um, you know, to me, an old uh, painting, half the charm of it is those stain marks in uh, an old drawing, I should say. But, um, yeah, when we were young, the Michelangelo was the brand we used for charcoal, and I don't know if that's anywhere to be had. I think the two that are the standard in my studio now are, are the uh, uh, Canson Angra and the, uh, and the Fabriano Angra. The, the, uh, the two, they are the two uh, ones that are easiest to get access to. Uh, we used to have a whole lot more available to us. Uh, I think it was Central Supply in New York way back in the 70s, but we, we bought off a lot of that, the last of that stock, and I don't know who's making what. In the use of charcoals, I have definitely found that uh, uh, the uh, superior grade is that, uh, I believe it's called Payard, but it's the one that's all written in French, so their hard is dur, you know, and, and uh, there are three grades. They, they're squarish. Uh, you'd have to look around a little bit. I think they're now manufactured possibly in Canada. And, uh, but they are by far the best controlled, as far as I've been able to discern, uh, between the hardnesses. Uh, other brands, and I'm not mentioning any, uh, say hard and soft and that sort of thing, but they're very irregular. And every once in a while you can find a really beautiful stick in other ones, but I think the most consistent has been so far has been that uh, that brand with a French name. So, uh, yeah, so that's that part of it. And um, the kneaded eraser, there are kinds that are very greasy, oily, or fall apart differently. The uh, Eberhard Faber is by far the best, and it's um, uh, the nicest one to be able to draw with. You can sharpen the edge of it, you know, by squeezing, you know. But any, anybody who's worked with this kind of stuff knows about uh, kneaded erasers. Um, and your local, you know, art stores will carry any of that stuff. Uh, you know, I'm trying to do this in a really shortened version, but the, uh, but, but the efficiencies. I'll get to what we actually use in the studio in a second, but as far as brands go, I've never found anything, even though there are names that are celebrated like crazy, I've never found anything particularly better than, than Rembrandt and, uh, and Winsor Newton. So there it is. Uh, once in a while, they're a little problematic, particularly the... Uh, the uh, uh, blacks occasionally would be really oily in the Rembrandt, and uh, obnoxiously so. <laughs> and uh, but for the most part, though, those two, I've never had any bad results over over multiple, you know, many decades of painting, and I basically have stuck with them for that reason. Uh, so, and I wouldn't, you know, I'm not, as I said, I'm not out there trying to be a perfectionist. I want something that's very adequate and that will s survive over time. And uh, so you just, you know, you avoid using the fugitive, what are known as the fugitive colors, and um, which are the ones that, that uh, don't hold their color over time, or when they get mixed with something else will actually change, like the old problem with the, uh, the matters mixed with a lead white would lose their red. Uh, the problem that was famously uh, 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 injurious to the Reynolds, to a number of the Reynolds uh, portraits. So, but you can read all about that sort of thing in, uh, in those various books uh, on uh, materials and, 
and Methods Mayor is one, and then there are a couple others done about the same time. I think Mayor's Teacher did one. I'm trying to remember the guy's name. But there are at least two or three of those from the old days that are, that are full of the information of those days. Um, so, uh, and then uh, when it comes to the brushes, I mean, there's that question of whether we use, um, what kind of brushes we use. Uh, I, I, was, I was sort of raised on, because of their versatility, on the uh, filberts. But uh, the longer I paint, the more I'm using rounds. Uh, not exclusively, but the round and the filbert. I don't, I don't find a great use for the uh, flats. Um, and I should say for the flats, but particularly for the brights, the, the double corners, just I, I find them problematical. Uh, but for certain kinds of things, obviously, every brush is of great use. And, uh, of the softer ones, uh, I mean, these are bristle brushes now we're talking about for oils. Of the softer ones, uh, I've, I don't use sables. They, they, they fall apart too quickly. I find the Monarch, uh, they have a, 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 a sort of a look-alike to the stable. It holds its shape way better, lasts over time, went through washings and that sort of thing. It does everything else just as well. Uh, I've never found anything that sables do better than, than the, uh, this particular brush, the Monarch. You'll have to look at it. I, I'm not, I didn't go pull up my papers. This is all seat of the pants conversation. I didn't go pull up those uh, 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 brushes and look at them to tell you the individual names. They come in a pretty good variety of sizes. Now, I have found that if you're using a, a, a slick board, I don't particularly, uh, uh, I, 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 I re fairly quickly switch to, a, um, to one of those kinds of brushes, a, a softer brush. Uh, uh, but using it for normal purposes, I don't use anything but a bristle, and every just every once in a while have have reason to use uh, a um, the, even the monarch. You know, in a portrait, I use it probably more than any place else uh, for particular things. But um, but then the so the brands. I mean, we, we used to love. I think the Rathbone was a really great one back in the old days, and uh, and today I've seen there's I think there's something called rosemary. There's a silver tone or something like that. There are several brushes that seem to be lasting in my, you know, in my uh, jars of brushes. They seem to be lasting very nicely, holding their shape. Um, the one thing I look for in a brush is for the brush to be, the old standard was like two and a half times at least longer than its width. And uh, I see that there are any number of companies that are really doing a good job of keeping the length right, uh, not trying to save on the length of bristles. So. Um, those are the ones I do recommend, uh, and, and the longer the better. The Egbert, uh, some people like that. Some of my friends, I think Bob Hunter used to use that, and uh, uh, I just never really could get my head around that one. It, it required way too much medium to keep it from just becoming a, uh, a, a problematical thing to work with, but uh, every brush has its purpose and time, and uh, you'll surprise yourself. You know, It's a good idea to have a variety of them. Uh, yeah, even including fan brushes, you know, for knocking off um, glare, knocking off ridges down a little bit, and that sort of thing, uh, and other purposes. Um, I'm not a guy who's particularly looking for for effects for their own sake. I had a nice time looking at the Emil Carlson show uh, last week, and uh, here in New England, and uh, I found the. Um, uh, his idea of making like a, like literally a mosaic out of his marks and that sort of thing uh, would have required probably slightly different brushes from what I use. Some of them probably could have been just the end of rounds and others something else. Uh, but you know, I, those kinds of personal touches, those things. I mean, some of them I think come out of the sheer fact that you got um, stuck with a certain kind of brush because you didn't have the money to buy another one, and before you knew it, you were you were friends with it and had found it would do all sorts of magical things that were right up your alley. And uh, so I do recommend you try things. Um, the one thing I re don't recommend though is you think they'll solve any of your problems because <laughs> there's just no uh, end to the numbers of stories of our friends who kept doing that and doing that when they weren't in the classroom studying, they weren't before the model, they weren't behind the easel. And uh, there is nothing out there in the form of a medium that's gonna save you. That's going to save you from just learning to see and learning to, um, you know, manage the truth in front of you. But having said that, you know, just there are better ways. I mean, there are better tools for certain things, and 
first of all, get your, your head around what it is you're trying to accomplish, you know, by using whatever tool you have. And then uh, wonder from time to time, switch to a different brush from time to time, is what I find, is what I recommend to students. Um, so that's on that, that level. Let's see, there was, there was one other question I think might be actually of more interest just out of, the, out of my background and the, and the Boston School um, uh, viz, the impressionist training I had before that, and that has to do with the colors uh, and the number of, the, the kind of palette I set now. And um, that's changed so completely. When I was in New York when I, at the Art Students League working with the impressionist Brackman, uh, which any number of people of us, among us did who, who, who were concerned about color and that whole problem of, uh, of uh, uh, you know, the problem of light related to it, that sort of thing, may have worked with him. We had no fewer than, I, I remember counting them, 19 colors. We, we, we had this whole range of yellows in the cadmiums and then oranges and then reds in the cadmiums and, and, uh, and all the way down, then down, of course, the other side uh, of the greens and blues, uh, permanent greens and viridians and all that stuff. <laughs> and uh, I'm laughing about it a little bit because since then, well, let me jump over. First of all, they, there was a bunch of earth colors also in that palette, and it was, I always found it problematical, the earth colors being so much more, uh, I didn't, wouldn't have had a word for it precisely at the time, but so much more opaque. I say, well, not all of them, but any number of them, you know, like a Indian red or something like that, or, or, or navels or uh, uh, yellow ochre, they're so opaque compared to, say, an alizarin, or, or even the cadmiums are considerably less opaque uh, in, in themselves. And uh, the consistency seems, it makes a difference to me. I, I find a, a certain amount of, as close to a consistent level of opacity as desirable to me anyway. Uh, I say it that way because I was, at, again, at that Carlson show, I was very impressed, and a lot of the tonalists did the same thing, but I was very impressed with his, um, his capacity to make a completely opaque painting. And there was every inch of it, all the darks, everything else was saturated with white. And uh, so the, the, there was virtually no ability to produce a, a transparent, even, even the illusion of transparency was gone from, from uh, a number of those pictures and were marvelous in their own way uh, because of, with, that, with that particular unity. So there's nothing about that that I would pick on. I, I just simply have found that for what I'm trying to do and what I'm trying to accomplish, which does include what we call atmospheric effects, you know, the atmospheric truth, um, that the, the color itself, it's useful for the color itself to be, relatively speaking, to be um, trans, trans, transparent, translucent. And, uh, and then we go and uh, uh, add white to, you know, virtually everything has white in it on some level. And so there's a tendency, because of what white does, to, for things to become less so, especially in the lights. But uh, some people would argue, well, isn't that just the perfect balance, you know, transparent in the darks and, uh, and less... So in the lights, yeah, uh, a rational thing, I think. But um, the other side of that, though, is the, uh, uh, or a piece of that, though, uh, that I would like to include just in this conversation for two seconds, is that when you're painting, it used to be that people thought that to be transparent in the shadows meant literally to use transparent paint, and, uh, or, or to have a medium, a very viscous medium, that would feel like uh, you were looking through glass or something like that. And that there's a whole number, including like Rubens and others, who were doing something rather like that. There's some paintings by, I think there's one of the Museum of Fine Arts that has a, <laughs> it looks like a half inch thick uh, uh, glaze of medium on it by Rembrandt. And <laughs> it's just puddling in it. And it's pretty cool, you know, it's pretty fun. But um, what I found as a Boston School type painter with the idea of uh, being a, a, a drawing impressionist, as a Prussianist who doesn't just make spe specs and spots, do everything, uh, I've found that if you get all the chroma in the shadows, you will have transparency. And you could argue that, well, yeah, of course, that's because all those colors that you're using, <laughs> when they're dark, look very transparent. That's a, that's a reality. The colors themselves actually are more transparent. But, but, but the, the truth is that all we can see with our eyes is values in color, right? I mean, you can say words like transparent. It doesn't actually mean, to me, it doesn't mean a thing. Uh, if you get the color note right, and the other color note right, and the other one, and they're all right in relation to each other, 
uh, if they're actually right, if you actually saturate your shadows with color, much as the Boston School uh, uh, references, you will get the sense of atmosphere. It's yours. And of course, in combination, you really do have to combine it with flatness, with the unity of that value, so that you're not dealing with accidental form in the shadows in the wrong ways, so overstated um, uh, backlight or anything like that. But, um, but the atmosphere is not produced precisely by anything like backlight, it's produced by the color. So that makes us, uh, 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 you know, sort of gets me at least past this big worry about, uh, about the um, opaque versus transparent. Uh, but about the palette that we actually use now, so that was a 20 or 19 color palette. When we got to Gamel, I think we were still using maybe 12 colors, among which were, I want to say, six possibly were, were, um, were uh, earth colors. And uh, now we're, uh, I mean, and, and what happened was that I found that the earth colors, see, as, as you become an impressionist, you begin to realize that the way you find a color note is by putting one down and adjusting it with another one, you know, like literally adjusting through it and into it, as you can all guess. And, and what a Boston School type painter does is you do it on the canvas in front of you. You're not trying to remix this color every time. You finally got the perfect color up there. So you're always building with the idea of you want a lot of color to show. So if you, have, you put down a note and it's too red, it needs some, some green or if it needs some, uh, some, some blue or even some yellow, you simply match the value and chroma of that thing and set those colors in there and don't overmix them and you'll get a certain lively, but you'll get a, you know quality. But what it basically means, what I found it basically means is all you actually need on a paint, on a palette is the spectrum. You might say red, yellow, blue, right? And you need it to produce, uh, and you need to, they need to be all of a great enough strength that they will easily influence any other color. Now about that last point, yellow ochre is powerless. Naples yellow, I mean, they, you can't, as color goes, I mean, they can lighten the color if it's Naples or whatever, but as color goes, they have no strength compared to what we use, which is the lemon yellow in the cadmiums. Uh, so let me give you my palette anyway. It's, it's a red, yellow, blue palette. And what I try to do is do a version of a warm and a cool of each one of these notes, right? So I think of red, yellow, and blue. And so we have on the red end, we have uh, alizarin and the scarlet, uh, academy of scarlet is the warm red, it's, which you might equate to, to orange. So those are the reds. Then you move over to the yellow family. We have the, the uh, and this is an interesting way that I think about this stuff. But and you, if you lay it out like a like a rainbow, it makes sense. But you see the yellow, um, the, the cadmium yellow on either side of it is the cadmium scarlet, and this and, and green, and both of which have relative amounts of yellow, as it were, right? So you have what you need in the yellow family in that little group right there. And when you go outdoors, you find that you instead of I'm using so I'm using a viridian for the green. But if you go outdoors, you'll actually need to add a like a permanent green light. Um, and that permanent green light plus the viridian gives you a warm cool, which is also, as I said, that's the factor with the, with the reds is as a warm cool. And then we get to the greens um, or to the, or yeah, to the, it, it happens all the way through the spectrum. So now finally then the green becomes the warm of the, more of the blues. So the, so the green arguably is the last blue. So I use, so I lose ultramarine and viridian on that end of the spectrum. So it goes, so it goes from a alizarin, so it goes from what you might call a purple red to a warm red to a yellow to a green to a blue. And that's the color group that I use, period. Every one of those colors, if you mix them, uh, either are at saturation, at a really intense level of saturation, or if you mix whites with them, as you would know about viridian, alizarin, and, uh, and ultramarine blue, they, they become more and more intense as they get to that sort of middle range of values. So, and they're very susceptible of changing. Any other color can be influenced quickly. And there's a relative uh, unity about how quickly they do it. I mean, probably nothing does it as quickly as, as the two reds, but, but they, their intensity is there. So it's easy for it to use a color, not get, getting into too much paint, and just without a whole lot of paint influencing the other colors, moving a red off to become a purple and moving a, 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 you know, a green off, off toward the... Uh, toward the warmer side, toward the, toward the yellows, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the basic strategy. So that's my palette, it's five colors and a black and a white. I do use ivory white and, uh, and flake 
I'm sorry, ivory black and flake white as, as those two colors. In the uh, summertime, I, we, we add a warm blue, um, which is the Severus blue, it has incredible intensity compared to other blues. So people say that used, that's what, um, uh, that's what the uh, cerulean used to be. Uh, I don't know why that would be what changed, but, but Severus is a powerful uh, blue. I'm told it's based on, on one of the, um, oh, what is that family, um, you know, relatively new family of intense uh, phyla, of phthalo blue type, type colors, I think. But so that's it. It's basically five colors, but they're, every one of them is intense. I've never been a fan. I've messed with it. I've, I've painted from it. Of the, of the four color thing that includes black and white as two of the colors, you know. You know. Uh, so there's a weak red and a bad yellow, you know, and then black and white. I mean, I've never found it. You get re really good uh, results from that. Uh, Zorn is supposed to have done it, uh, and, some, and you can easily see where he gives up on it from time to time and does, less, does other things. A little, uh, but um, he's got a very good sense of color relations, which is the key to everything we do. So I think that maybe, oh, the question of mediums, I've addressed that before, so if you go look that up uh, on one of our talks, I don't want to get into it much. I just, you know, the, the simplest way is the best way. I don't recommend use any mediums except the mediums are already in the paint. And once in a while, a little bit of terps, but I don't really like to see terps in paint. There's, there can be a reason, but I don't know of a very good one. Uh, virtually anything you need to do, you can do with uh, oils, and you keep the consistent uh, unity, uh, the consistent quality of the uh, uh, the, the consistency of the same medium. Uh, you can easily overdo that. People put in too much yellow before you know it. It's, it can just be running down the canvas and other things like that. But um, you do need the liquidity, though, for really tr when, you're, when you're in our world and you're trying to make a beautiful uh, edge, a wet edge with a, with a relative amount of sharpness, uh, you do need to get to something like a, a greater liquidity. And all you need is the medium that was originally in the paint. But that's, that's, I think, a full assessment of what we do. Uh, yeah, and I hope I gave you enough of a reason why, Sandra. Thank you very much for the question. Uh, if you don't mind, you know, share these things. Uh, uh, comment, please. You can comment, by the way, on any of the videos. I glance at them all from time to time just to see if there are any fresh ones because there are some subjects that uh, I'm surprised haven't come back up. But don't feel like if they're an old video, you shouldn't look. Anyway, thank you, Sandra, very much. See you all uh, in a few days.